74 years ago, as World War II neared its end, Adolfo Harpo Celaya, a scrappy Mexican-American teenager from Florence, Arizona, wanted to join the Navy. They had big signs there, join the Navy and see the world and all that stuff, but beautiful girls on it. The only catch, too young. He needed his father's permission. I wanted him to sign for me to go into the Navy. Harpo's wish was granted. He found himself in boot camp. Before long, he was shipping out on the USS Indianapolis. And they took us down to go over and see the ship, and I looked at that thing, and I, boy, I almost ran all the way back to Florence. I mean, it was, it was big. Harpo settled in the Indy, but it wasn't smooth sailing. So they would pick on me and say, why didn't I go back to Mexico where I came from? Harpo fought back, sometimes getting physical. The Indian engaged in the bloody battles of Iwo Jima and Okinawa. Harpo witnessed, but was not impressed, by what would become one of the most iconic images of the entire war. I took the binoculars and had it back there, big deer like that, and I took off. In 1945, Japanese kamikazes slammed into the bow of the Indian. It killed the uh, nine men at that time. Yeah. That moment, the harsh reality of war sunk in. And that's when I first knew that I wasn't going to go to see them girls. And <laughs> On a hot summer night in 1945, a Japanese submarine spotted the Indianapolis launching two torpedoes. It blew the whole bow on the, the second one hit in the middle right where I was at. Fire engulfed the ship. Within 12 minutes, the USS Indianapolis sunk. I could hear him hollering, I'm on fire, I'm on fire, stuff like that. Hardly able to see while escaping, fate took over. He ran into his friend Santos Pena. The two jumped ship. Where did you guys jump off? Right here. He says he landed hard in the water, injuring his knees, thinking he might have killed his friend Santos. Harpo joined hundreds of fellow sailors floating like buoys in the sea for days, but the world would soon learn of perhaps the deadliest shark attack in history. We were uh, quiet and all of a sudden the screen came up and Everybody could hear it. And that scream gets to you. Through it all, Harpo never lost a sense of humor, joking. He was spared because sharks didn't like, quote, dark meat. But after several days floating at sea, he says, men became delirious. They were drinking salt water and all that. They, they would attack you. They would pick fights with you. While caring for his ailing chi, Harpo heard men speaking Spanish. <laughs> I thought I was going crazy. Harpo swam to the sound and found Santos alive. But when he returned to his chief, he was too late. He was floating away too weak to survive. I thought about it every night since it happened. But it never has gotten away from me. And I wish I could get it away from me sometime. Upon rescue, Harpo was not treated as an injured hero. In fact, he was disciplined singled out day after day when asked to be excused from duty due to his sustained injuries. What he still thinks to this day was because of his dark skin. It's bothered me more than anything. Because I, I had a rough time when I was in there. They put me into a little cage and, and stuff like that. So you felt like a prisoner? Yeah. After serving your country, delivering the parts of the bomb, surviving in the water for five days, five nights, you're punished. Yeah. Remarkable story. To this day, Harpo avoids baths and beaches. He went on to run a successful business, often helping people in need. But returning to Tucson after the war, he suffered from PTSD and numbed his pain with alcohol. Then a visit from his high school basketball coach would set Harpo on an unusual and improbable athletic course, one which may have saved his life. Paul Sikala continues his story in A Man of Courage, Part 2, Monday night at 6.